Well, hello once again, and welcome back to History of the Restoration Movement Archives. This is module number 13, and in this module we'll be discussing the topic of baptism. Specifically, baptism as it will become to be understood by members of the Restoration Movement. For those who are familiar with the Restoration Movement, baptism becomes, for the most part, the premier doctrine, that it is enunciated in such a way that the Restoration Movement becomes somewhat distinct from other American denominations in regard to what is baptism, how do you do it, and more specifically, what does it accomplish that the Restoration Movement will have a very nuanced idea of baptism. And to give a quick overview, that nuanced idea is that baptism should be in the mode of immersion, i.e., that a person should be dunked fully underwater, that it should be a believer's baptism. And by that we mean that a person should be of an age where they can profess their faith in Christ Jesus. And then finally, and this will be where the Restoration Movement is largely unique compared to Zwinglian ideas of baptism, that the Restoration Movement will have an idea that Immersion is specifically for the remission of sins. That there is a salvation transaction that happens during baptism. And this will be enunciated first by uh, Alexander Campbell, but will then be taken up and championed by Walter Scott. And between the two of them, this doctrine of baptism that is immersionist, Believer's baptism for the remission of sins will become not just the premier doctrine in the Restoration Movement, but will become a defining doctrine of the Restoration Movement. So, for our first Le Long Dure topic here, uh, let's discuss washing rituals, because as many uh, historians have noted, most religions have a washing ceremony, some kind of a ceremony that a person bathes ritually in order to accomplish something, usually a ritualized cleaning. And so it is fair to ask the question, what makes Christian baptism unique as a washing ritual? So let's start off by doing a quick word study. The word where we get our word baptism is from a Greek word called baptizo. Now, the root of this word has a couple different denotations, but the biggest ones are to dip, to dunk, to submerge, or to otherwise place an object fully underwater. Um, for example, in uh, Plutarch, when he describes a naval battle, and again, Plutarch is a Greek, so he is writing in Greek, he describes several of the ships that sink during this battle as having been baptizoed, or submerged. And so it stands to reason that the word baptizo has a strong original connotation with the notion of an object being fully underwater. Now, when we get to the New Testament usage of this Greek word, one thing that we'll find is that the term does have quite a few other connotations that show up from time to time. And it's good to look at the full semantic range before we make any real decisions about what does this word mean. But one of the first things that we see it being used as, as is as an adjective. In Matthew 3, 1, we see the term being used to modify John and his profession. Literally, his name would be John the Dunker. We know him, of course, as John the Baptist. But... What stands out here is that John could be known by this action. That what makes this John unique among other Johns living in Judea at the time is that he is performing this washing ritual. And that he is doing this ritual in a place where there's at least enough water to put a human being underwater, i.e. he's doing this in the Jordan River. Now, I'd also like to point out that this word baptizo can be used to describe Jewish washing rituals that don't necessarily apply just to the human body. 
Uh, for example, in Mark 7, 4, uh, there is the description here where it says, uh, when they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. Again, the word here, baptizo for wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing, again, baptizo, of cups, pitchers, and kettles. And so Mark here is describing pharisaical traditions, and he is specifically talking about baptisms or washings that happen both to the body and baptisms that happen of cups, pitchers, and kettles. And so it is not out of the question for a Jewish person to think of this word baptism as having a very wide semantic range of things we dunk, not just our bodies, but of cups, utensils, and other things. I.e., it's a very common word to wash and to submerge and to basically perform a cleaning ritual. In fact, this ritual will become so prominent in Judea that one of the primary archaeological finds that we find in the city of Jerusalem anymore are these washing pools called mikvahs. And all of this is just simply to say that washing rituals are very, very common in Judaism. Now, I would like to stress, though, that one of the things that will make Christian baptism unique is that in most Judaism and in the washing rituals that are in Judaism, most of these rituals are performed by a person themselves, i.e., if I wash, I wash myself. If I am cleaning a cup, I wash my cups. Baptism will be somewhat unique from these Jewish versions of washing rituals in that somebody else must baptize another. Now, in addition to these washing rituals that were prominent in Judaism, I'd also like to point out that the New Testament writers do use the term baptism to describe events that specifically have to do with water, but not necessarily with the submerging of the subject. And here's, and this is often an example of what's called a typological hermeneutic, where an Old Testament event will become a type or a figure of baptism. And this is a very common hermeneutical device used by the New Testament authors. But probably let's go for a big, for an example here. In 1 Peter 3.19, we read this. In it, he went and preached to the spirits in prison after they were disobedient long ago when God patiently waited in the days of Noah as the ark was being constructed. In the ark, a few, that is to say, eight souls, were delivered through water. And this prefigured baptism, which now saves you. And it's not the washing of physical dirt, but the pledge of a good conscience to God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, notice the way Peter uses this term here. He says that the ark that Noah built is a figure of baptism. Now, keep in mind, this ark never submerges. It's never described as a submarine, meaning that the people who are on the ark do not go fully underwater. And that will become a very big sticking point when a lot of detractors of the Restoration Movement will do their own word studies. They will note that the word baptism does not have to have a 100% correlation with the subject going fully underwater, as in this case here. Now, not to be left out of the mix, Paul will use a very similar typological hermeneutic in 1 Corinthians 10. Here we read, starting in verse 1, For do you not, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our fathers were all under the cloud that passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and they all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were all drinking from the spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Now, you notice here, Paul is using a very, a very strong typological argument. Almost everything from the Exodus account, starting pretty much from verse 15, or chapter 15 onward in Exodus, has a correlation to something in the New Testament. Uh, 
the cloud and the sea are figures of baptism. The rock from which water is coming from and the spiritual food that they're eating are typologically associated with Christ. But notice here specifically that we never have a description of the cloud enveloping the Jewish, uh, or sorry, the Israelite camp. And even more profoundly, we don't have any, uh, any real description in the Exodus account of the water of the Red Sea going over or submerging the Israelites. In fact, most readings of Exodus would read uh, the crossing of the Red Sea as an extremely dry event for the Israelites and only a very wet event for the Egyptians who will drown because of the water coming back. And so all of this is to say that Paul and Peter really don't seem to have much of a qualm of using the baptism metaphor in reference to an event where the subject does not go fully underwater. And this will at least be something to keep in mind that while the majority of the usages of the word baptism will in fact be to refer to dunk a item underwater, there is not a 100% correlation. There are moments where people will use the term baptize, baptizo, to typologically at least refer to an event where the subject does not go underwater. So while we're on the question of typologies or symbolism, or specifically that one referent could symbolically mean another, Paul uses two types of symbolism when he's associated with baptism. One of the symbols he uses is a washing symbol. The other symbol he uses is a burial symbol. Let's start with the washing one because it's the one that makes the most sense when you are dunking someone underwater. Uh, for example, when Paul is giving his testimony in Acts 22, 16, he tells the way that uh, the man who baptized him, he basically recounts his own memories of this, and Paul says this, And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and have your sins washed away, calling on his name. And so, I'd like to point out, in that instance, Paul is referring to baptism as a washing away. And if his memory is serving correctly, it is also the first time he's hearing, what does baptism mean? What is it all about? And so, his introduction to the Christian faith would be that baptism is for the washing away of sins. Now, he'll also use a second symbol, and we'll see this happening a lot in his letter to the Romans, but one particular moment stands out to me, and that's Romans 6, verse 3 and 4, where he says, Or do you not know that as many as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. Now, here... Paul is actually using the water to symbolize a burial in the ground, which I find is a fairly provocative thing. While, you know, to use it for a washing away of sins makes sense because we are actually doing a bath, and therefore the washing away has a one-to-one -one correlation with other things that we do when we wash. Here, we don't really have a one-to-one -one correlation that being placed underwater is a symbol for the grave. And it does have some correlations, i.e. if you stay underwater long enough, it will kill you. So it does have this idea of that under the water equals a death. And so in many ways, Paul's second um, symbol here for baptism is that we are performing your burial. We are killing the old you, and whatever comes up out of the water is going to be the new person in Christ. And so, in both of these cases, both of these symbols must be kept in mind. That, at least in, as far as Paul's thought is concerned, baptism has two major symbologies. One, 
it is for the washing away of sins, and two, and second, it is for the um, specifically for the having a person experience their own death, their own burial under the water. Now, as we continue our study of the New Testament use of the word baptism, let me note for the record that the majority of the uses of this term are to be in conjunction with what will become the Christian ritual of initiation. And by this I mean that this will be the ritual that Christians will perform when they add another member to their number. In the book of Acts, this will be almost ubiquitous. Acts chapter 2. Many will be saved at Peter's preaching. They will become baptized. Acts uh, chapter 8. The Samaritans will hear the gospel from Philip. They will be baptized. Uh, for later on in Acts chapter 8, an Ethiopian will hear the gospel from Philip. He will be baptized. Acts chapter 9. Paul will hear the gospel. He will be baptized. Acts chapter 10. Uh, the, um, the household of uh, Cornelius will hear the word and be baptized. And so, I'd like to point out that this word baptism most frequently is used in the New Testament to describe this ritual of initiation. And that this will be a very prominent thing that, it, that the New Testament really doesn't seem to know of a believer who has not been through this ritual. That every time it describes a conversion, it is pretty consistent of saying that baptism follows their confession of belief. Now, this word baptism also tends to have a certain, we'll call it a uh, etymological problem. And that is, most of us don't translate this word baptism. We don't translate it to what it means in English, to dunk, to submerge, etc., etc. Instead, we transliterate it, meaning we take all of the sounds, baptizo, and we bring it over into English, baptism. And so, what we've done here is we've taken this word that has a very distinct set of connotations, and we basically made it its own thing by transliterating it. In doing that, we've, we've stressed the nature of this Christian initiation ritual, that it is something unique in and of itself. But at the same time, we've obscured its meaning, at least its original sets of meanings, by doing this. Now, we can date this all the way back to the Latin Vulgate, where St. Jerome, around 400, when he's doing his Latin translation, will simply transliterate this word, baptizo. And it's been with us in transliteration and not translation ever since. Now, for proof that this word genuinely means to submerge or dunk, I, Exhibit A is simply our picture that we have here. This is a Greek Orthodox baptism. Now, this is of an infant, but notice that they are clearly putting the baby underwater. Because in Greek Orthodoxy, i.e. a church where Greek is still the primary language, this transliterated issue doesn't come through at all. They simply hear the word baptism, and while they may think of the Christian ritual of initiation, they also think of this generic term for washing, which is why we can see even today in Orthodox circles, baptism always involves an immersion. Now, one of the results of this transliteration problem is that once we go into the West, in the Latin West specifically, uh, Europe, France, Spain, Italy, Great Britain, all of these areas will be profoundly influenced by the Vulgate. And as such, they will begin taking a few liberties with what the word means. And so today, often when we discuss the word baptism, there's often three modes that will get used. The first mode is often known as pouring. 
And this mode is where you take a large amount of water and you pour on the head. Now, a slightly less water-filled version of that is what is known as sprinkling. And often in sprinkling, we don't have anywhere near the amount of water being poured on the head that we have in a pouring. And I often like to joke, what is the difference ultimately between pouring and sprinkling and that is enough water to make a baby cry is used in pouring. Whereas in sprinkling, we are just using a very small amount of water. Now, true to the original root of the word, many groups, for example, those in the Restoration Movement, uh, Baptist, and many, uh, and many charismatic groups, uh, still use immersion as the primary means of baptism. So, just kind of pointing out that in the West, because this word baptism was transliterated, we've taken quite a few liberties with how can you do one, especially if we haven't tied the word down to this idea of dunking. And so what is currently in existence is these three modes, pouring, sprinkling, and immersion. So let's talk about the controversy over baptism, because many denominations will have it be a very strong sticking point for them that if baptism is done incorrectly, you must do it again. And so, when we're dealing with theological questions about baptism, really there's four kinds or four types of questions. The first question that comes up is the historical one. How did so many of these variations arise? And as we discussed, it's largely due to the transliterated issue that in the West we've just gotten used to transliterating the word baptism and not translating it. But that will become the first question, just how is it that everyone has so many different ideas? Now, the second question that comes up is, well, if there's so many ideas, what's the right way to do it? And again, we're down to three choices, immersion, sprinkling, and pouring. Now, a third question that will come up as well as, well, then, if what is what is the proper subject of baptism? Who are we allowed to baptize? And there we will basically narrow it down to two possibilities. Believers in Christ or children who are children of believers in Christ. And then fourthly, the question that will more infrequently come up, because most Protestants tend to take a Zwinglian view of this, is what spiritually happens to a believer when they are baptized. And as I kind of said in our introduction to this module, the Restoration Movement will take a very sacramental view of believer's baptism, that an actual transaction of grace takes place when a person is baptized. But again, to contrast that with the Zwinglian view, the Zwinglian view would simply say, this is a ritual we do out of obedience. So let's shift gears here and answer that first question. How did so many different variations come about? Well, the answer to that is they actually started coming about very, very early in Christian history. And the first uh, group of Christians to develop an alternate form of back a baptism will be found in a early, early second century document. Again, we're talking written about 100 AD, and this document is known as the Didache, or the Teachings of the Twelve Apostles. And this will be the first document that will really suggest different modes of baptism, that it doesn't have to be just a dunking. Now, here's what Didache 3 5 says. Concerning baptism, baptize in this way. After you have spoken all of these things, i.e. that we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, then baptize them in living or running water. If you do not have living water, baptize in other types of water. If you are unable to baptize in cold water, then use warm. If you do not, if you do not have either pour out water three times on the head. And so what we see here is we see kind of a hierarchy developing. 
The tradition will be to baptize a person, fully submerge them in running water. However, if you have a difficulty finding that or using that, you're allowed other means and the hierarchy goes down from less and less and less water until we are simply pouring water on the head. Now, I'd like to connect this back to the Paul issue that we had discussed earlier, that Paul uses two kinds of symbolism with regard to baptism. The first kind is with washing, but the second kind of symbolism Paul uses is for burial. Now, you notice here that the authors of the Didache have their focus on the washing aspect, but not necessarily the burial. Because if we are allowing for pouring to take the place of an immersion, what we are basically saying is you having this symbolism of being fully under some, the water and having that connected with being under the ground, buried with Christ, that that idea is not as strong as the idea of washing. And I'd like to suggest that this will profoundly influence the doctrine of baptism all the way up through about 1500 AD. Because what will happen here is the focus of baptism as a ritual will almost always more heavily focus on the washing aspect and not the burial aspect. Now, again, not saying that one is more superior than the other. I'm simply saying that both are biblical, and yet one is chosen to be the focus, i.e. washing. Now, about a century and a half later, a bishop from northern Africa in the city of Carthage, bishop's name is Cyprian, he'll also weigh in on the subject. And I'd just like to kind of say that for the record, Cyprian will really kind of open the gate, as it were, to allow for other modes of baptism besides immersion to become dominant. And really about 800 or so AD, we're going to see seeing baptisms as immersions happening in the West. Though, as we pointed out with our picture, in the East, where they continue to speak Greek, we will see immersions continue all the way through th to the present day. But in his, uh, his epistle uh, that we have of uh, Cyprian, uh, 69, in chapter 69, verse 12, we read this. You have also asked what I thought concerning those who obtain God's grace in sickness and in weakness, whether they are accounted as legitimate Christians, because they are not washed with the water of salvation, but have it poured on them instead. Now, a little bit of backstory here. In general, when people are living during the time of Cyprian, it's very common for people to get sudden illnesses that are lethal within a couple of weeks. This will be especially true with children. It's estimated that during this time of the Roman Empire, about one out of every two children dies within the first year. And this will raise up a lot of interesting questions, but for now, let's just look at the issue that death in this time period can often happen very suddenly. And in a world where you don't really have a lot of medicine, where you don't have a lot of medical practice to deal with sickness, a person can get on their deathbed very quickly because of a high fever. And so Cyprian here is describing an account of Christians who have been baptized because they were extremely sick. And, and rather than dunking them and run the risk of that killing them, they decided to use a pouring method instead. Now, here is how Cyprian is going to weigh in on this, and I, and I find his answer to be somewhat intriguing. He says, We think that the divine benefits can in no way be mutilated or weakened. In the sacraments of salvation, when necessity compels, and God bestows his mercy, the divine abridgments confer the whole benefit on believers. Just kind of summing that up, Cyprian says, 
if necessity, if we have a need, an emergency, then God still bestows his mercy in baptism, even if we do a pouring. And he further goes on to say, Nor should anyone be troubled that the sick persons seem to be sprinkled or poured upon when they obtain the Lord's grace. Meaning that he's going to say, you know, if we're already using less water than it takes to dunk someone, we and that doesn't cause any, any uh, drawback, it does not... Uh, it does not cause a believer to not get grace. In that case, then, what's the difference between a sprinkling or a pouring? And so Cyprian is really going to open the floodgates for that of a sprinkling or a pouring has 100% the same effect as an immersion. And this will really be kind of the linchpin in the argument as we see going through here, that it really doesn't matter how much water you use, just as long as you're using some kind of water. And again, this will focus heavily on the washing aspect, and not on the burial aspect. So just kind of summing up some key ideas of Cyprian's argument here. Uh, again, this is uh, these ideas are not apostolic, but many evangelicals will take a lot of these ideas for granted, especially your um, Presbyterians, uh, your Methodists, and other people that would be considered evangelicals during the time when the Re Restoration Movement is first getting off the ground. Firstly, he will ask the question if incorrect mode invalidates the ritual. And to this he is going to give a decisive answer. Using a different mode does not invalidate the ritual. Now, he will also note that pouring and sprinkling are for emergencies. That he will still, by around 200 AD, be saying, dunking is the primary mode. But sprinkling and pouring can happen in the event of an emergency. Okay, so shifting gears here again, um, we noticed in several of our pictures that we saw baptisms happening involving children, specifically pre-communicative infants. And this raises another question. Why did we start baptizing infants, specifically initiating children into Christianity before they can be at an age to say one way or another, I want in on this religion. Now, again, this is going to be a very early development. And by that, I mean that within the first three centuries of Christianity, we're going to see infant baptizing take off. And the primary reason for doing this is going to be the problem that children as we hinted earlier, don't have a very good life expectancy during this time. In fact, if half of our children are dying, and we are using baptism to say this is the ritual where a person becomes a Christian, where they inherit the grace of Jesus Christ, well then, what happens to my child if I haven't baptized them becomes an enormous question. Now, one of the first questions that will come up will be this. Can a child be sinful? And this will come in direct uh, contrast with baptism as being a symbol for the washing away of sins. And so, we have to ask the question, does a child have any sins that need to be washed away? And it is noteworthy to note that many of the early church fathers are really kind of conflicted on this question. Now, certainly people like Athenagoras, he will favor heavily this idea that children, especially pre-talking infants, cannot sin and do not have any ability to sin. Now, interestingly, he'll also go so far as to say, and they can't do any good either. They just exist. Here's the way he puts it in his uh, tract on the resurrection. Although all human beings who die are resurrected, not all of those who are resurrected are judged. For if judgment 
in the judge for if justice and the judgment were the only cause of the resurrection, it would follow, of course, that those who have not sinned nor done any good, namely very young children, would not be resurrected. And so he basically points out that if the resurrection's for everybody, then it may not necessarily be that these children are being resurrected to be judged. We're simply resurrecting them because they died and they need a resurrecting. Now, I find it interesting, though, that he just assumes a priori that they haven't sinned or can't sin, just as he assumes a priori that they haven't done anything good, that simply that they are existing and in need of existing again. Now, on the flip side of that, we're going to start seeing a very, very smart scholar from Alexandria named Origen chime in on the other side of that equation. And Origen's understanding after the time of Augustine, about roughly about 150 years later, will really become the dominant view of whether or not children sin, at least in the West. And in his commentary on Romans 5, Origen will say this, I take this occasion to discuss something which our brothers often inquire about. Infants are baptized for the remission of sins. But then he asks, well, what of, of what kinds? Or when did they sin? But since no one is exempt from stain, one removes the stain by the mystery of baptism. For this reason, infants are also baptized. For unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I find Origen's commentary to be really, really fascinating for several reasons, but one, he doesn't say that they've necessarily committed sin, but he calls it a stain. Now, Augustine, about 150 years later, will really kind of drive this idea home. Well, what kind of stain is it? And this is where we will get the idea of what's called original sin. That the sin of Adam, which we read about in Romans 5, has communicated down through all of his offspring up until the present day. And basically, when a child is born, they are born with this stain of original sin. It doesn't mean that they have committed any of their own sins, per se, but this stain itself is damning. And so, Origen will use that logic to basically say, you know, Christ says in John 3, unless you're born of the water and the Spirit, you can enter the kingdom of God. And he'll basically say, look, Entrance to the kingdom of God happens because of the water and the spirit, i.e., the two things we associate with baptism. Therefore, if a person is going to get into this heaven kingdom thing, well, you baptize them. And you baptize them early. And so, Origen is going to be really the first to really kind of drive this point home. And notice here that he's answering a question where someone says, why do we baptize infants? And so by the time he's writing this, sometime around the 200s, just be aware that people are asking questions why we're at baptizing infants. But underlying that question is the fact that they are baptizing infants. So again, very early on, we're going to see baptism happening with infants. And again, on a pretty wide scale. Now, the student of liturgy in me would like to point out that this seems to be an example of what's known as Lex Orandi, Lex Creandenti. And basically, that Latin term basically means our theology tends to follow our worship and our practice. And for this reason, people are going to begin to baptize infants. And again, it's probably due to high infant mortality rates. But once this practice has begun, all of a sudden we need a way to justify it. Why are we doing this? As Origen says, you know, some people are asking me, why are we baptizing our infants? And so we go and look through the scriptures to basically find an excuse or a justification for something we're already doing. And I would like to suggest that the doctrine of original sin may have come about 
in part or in full because of the reality that we're already doing infant baptisms. And we need a theological agenda or justification to say why we're doing baptisms. Ultimately, if you ask my opinion, it probably started something like this. Somebody with a very young infant is probably not going to make it. That person looks their pastor in the face and says, I want to know if my baby's going to go to heaven. You keep preaching that baptism is the only way to go. If that's true, will you baptize my baby before my baby dies? That pastor now is put in a very strong dilemma. Because he's been preaching this whole time, baptism saves you. And all of a sudden, if we start preaching that we're not going to baptize your infants, we're going to lose a lot of people simply because they say, this religion cannot save my child. And so... Personally, I think the practice begins just really out of concern for giving grieving parents a peace of mind that the religion they follow is big enough to deal with anything. Now, what we're going to see here, and again, I, I like keep referring back to John uh, Hopper here, but this may serve as another example of we started this in one generation. And we've been doing it for several generations until finally we get to the point where we can't really think of doing it any other way. That we started baptizing infants, and all of a sudden, now baptizing infants is a mandatory practice. We've sanctified it through current usage. This is an example of what this term, lex orandi, lex credenti. The things that we started doing in worship eventually need a theological justification. And the drawback to this is we won't necessarily be using a biblical justification, but instead using the Bible to justify something we're already doing. Now, moving on, this is going to be the most controversial aspect of baptism, which is the question, what really does baptism accomplish? And we'll even discuss this later when we get to uh, the Restoration Movement and how they started to eventually fall into this understanding of baptism. But i just kind of like to set the table for this by saying that early, early on, all of the early church fathers, all of the baptisms that we see happening in the New Testament, parallel a person making a belief statement of some sort. And that the transaction that happens from the moment they believe to the moment they are baptized happens in very, very quick succession. And it will be believed through most of the early church that the washing ritual of baptism is the moment that a person receives the Holy Spirit. And I would like to point out that, really, before 1520, I cannot find a single source that is saying that baptism is not the moment where a believer in God have their transaction, i.e. that the believer goes under the water and God gives them grace and saves them. I can't find a single source before the 1520s that say anything different. And so... In short, again, I can't stress this enough, you would be hard-pressed to find any Christian writer who did not think that baptism was the moment that a believer received grace. Now, after the 1520s, this will change. But that means that for the first 1,500 years of Christianity, the moment where a believer in God do their business and transact this salvation deal will be happening in baptism in the minds of any th writer or theologian. So this point of view is often known as efficacy and basically it says is baptism efficient or able to affect a consequence. Now I'd like to point out from a scriptural point of view uh, this idea of baptism being 
efficacious makes a lot of sense. The first generation Christians are being delivered the gospel for the first time, and the majority of the conversions are going to culminate in baptism. For example, Matthew 28, Jesus tells all of his disciples, go and make disciples, baptizing them. I.e., the moment they are, bapt- they are, the moment they are disciples, baptize them. We see this again in Acts 2.38. Peter preaches the first sermon after, on Pentecost. All of a sudden, he sa- they ask, well, what should we do? He says, well, repent and be baptized. Acts 18.8, we see another example. The uh, uh, Some disciples of John the Baptist are living in the city of Ephesus, and Paul finds them. And Paul asks them, well, have you received the Holy Spirit since you were baptized? And they're like, we didn't even know there was supposed to be a Holy Spirit. This is news to us. And Paul will baptize them again. And so, all of this and many other examples can be mustered, but just let me kind of point out here that when it comes to baptism, the New Testament makes a very strong correlation that the moment a person believes, they are baptized. And that they frequently use this washing away of sins metaphor. Or the you are going to be buried with Christ metaphor. To explain what happened to a person in baptism. I.e. that I think you can make an extremely strong case that it is the teaching of the New Testament. That a person receives grace in their baptism. And again, to further bolster this, that the first three centuries after the New Testament was written, we have a nearly, uh, again, I can't find a single source, but we have a ubiquitous position of the church that baptism is the moment when a person receives both salvation and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, Clement, another person writing in Alexandria a little bit before uh, the time of origin, will write this in his instructor. He will say, Being baptized, we are illuminated. And being illuminated, we are made children. Being made children, we are perfected. Being perfected, we are made immortal. This work is variously called a grace gift, illumination, perfection, and simply washing. It is the washing through which we are cleansed of our sins. The grace gift by which our penalties for sins are removed the illumination through which the holy light of salvation is beheld, and it is through which the divine is clearly seen. Instruction leads to faith, and faith, together with baptism, is trained by the Holy Spirit. We who have repented of our sins and renounced our faults are purified by baptism and have run back to the eternal light. Again, even more explicitly clear than we see in the New Testament, but a very clear one-to-one correlation. Baptism became and is the moment where a person receives the Holy Spirit, has their sins washed away, becomes a member of the family of God through this initiation ritual. So, we promise that this uh, new idea really kind of comes around in the 1520s, and the originator of this new idea of baptism will be from a man named Holdrich Zwingli of Switzerland. Now, Zwingli will be one of the earliest of reformers, and he is going to deny that any kind of spiritual transaction happens in the baptism ritual. Now, it should be noted that one of the things going on in both Zwingli and other reformers at the time, like Martin Luther, is there will start to be a very strong skepticism that a ritual or any action of the church actually communicates saving grace. That all it is is a ritual, an act, or some would go so far as to say a work. Timothy George, a historian, puts it this way. For Zwingli, baptism with the Spirit rather than water, was the means by which an individual was drawn into the orbit of divine salvation. The Spirit was not bound to external signs. God baptizes with the Spirit how, whom, and when he will. This emphasis would, li- would have led to the dissolution of external baptism altogether, as it did in certain radical reformers like Kaspar Schweckenfield, 
that it did not is due simply to Zwingli's strong sense of corporate nature of the visible church, i.e., Zwingli really only keeps baptism at all because it's still commanded in the New Testament. And people who follow a Zwinglian point of view of baptism are really going to stress this idea that we do it out of obedience. But to say that it's a moment of grace, a moment where a person receives salvation, well, that would simply be a salvation by works. And people like John Calvin will somewhat pick this up, but really the Zwinglian idea that baptism does not constitute the moment of salvation is going to really come about in the 1520s. And again, I'd like to point out that he, he is ultimately saying that being infilled with the Holy Spirit happens at a different time than baptism. And it, it's fair to ask, well, why did he think this? And I think the, uh, the answer is quite obvious. In the church at this time, we see quite a few abuses. We see, you know, salvation basically being bought and sold through the indulgence controversies. And to make, just to make things really, really simple, Zwingli has seen hundreds of Roman Catholic theologians arguing with him, and every one of them is baptized. But none of them is showing the signs of the Spirit, at least in his mind. And so he is basically saying, baptism is not a 100% guarantee someone is getting the Spirit, especially if they're baptized as a child or an infant. And so for Zwingli, he is going to divorce this idea that a person receives the Spirit at a different time than in baptism. Again, I can understand why he says what he says, but it is a very novel thing to suggest it. I can't find anyone saying it before the 1520s. And I think that in itself says something to the effect that he may be reading his Bible, but he is allowing his own circumstances to interpret those aspects of the Bible. Now, eventually, here is where, for our study of the Restoration Movement, here's where the rubber is really going to hit the road here. That Alexander Campbell, one of his first assessments that we can quote from him is simply this, that he's going to say, Infant sprinkling is an unauthorized mode of baptism performed on an unauthorized subject. And this is simply to say that the mode, i.e. sprinkling and pouring, is not authorized by the New Testament, because the word means to dunk. And it's performed on an unauthorized subject, i.e., every time we see a baptism in the New Testament, we see it happening to an adult. Now, this will come about because Alexander Campbell and his father Thomas will be very strong advocates of this, we are only going to use the Bible and we are going to draw our conclusions from the Bible alone. And again, if all we're using is the New Testament, we are saying everything, Zwingli, Origen, and all these people we looked at, if we're saying all of that is out of bounds but the Bible, we're really only left with a few conclusions. One, that really we only see adult believers getting baptized. We have no definitive proof from the New Testament that that includes an infant. Second, that the mode of baptism is immersion. And that's simply because that's exactly what the word means to a Greek-speaking audience. The original documents are written in Greek. It stands to reason the only thing we see is an immersion. And that baptism in the New Testament is fairly consistently described as the moment when a believer washes away their sins or becomes united with Christ in death i.e. see what we saw in Romans 6 for the united in Christ with death, or uh, back a little bit further where we see um, this idea of washing the sins away in Acts chapter 2. But in either case, there is a very strong correlation that 
in baptism, this is where you and God have your moment of salvation, and God saves you in this ritual. And this will eventually become problematic much, much later uh, in our uh, study, but let me just kind of set the stage for this by saying many people that are originally on board with Thomas Campbell when he writes his masterwork document, the Declaration and Address, many people are going to take this baptism issue and they're really going to say, I can't go there with you. And again, Campbell, both Thomas and Alexander, are coming out of Presbyterianism. And Presbyterians, as a group, have infant sprinkling. And so, as they start basically saying that infant sprinkling is the unauthorized mode performed on an unauthorized subject, many people, including someone like Thomas Atchison, who will be one of the co-authors with Thomas Campbell, of the Declaration and Address, will begin to pull back from the, the Restoration Movement, specifically because there's a lot of emotion and a lot of theological, uh, je ne sais quoi, I, I can't even come up with a word for this, but there's something that will keep a lot of people from going there with the Campbells. And so let it just be said for the record that this controversy will drive this first generation of Restoration Movement people, both the people who delve into this and get fully on board with this idea, and many of the competing denominations, and even people that are first interested and then turn away, that this baptism issue will be almost a defining characteristic of the rest Restoration Movement.